something in this? Should I change? And he did. And then an area I hadn't read much about before this project, transformational leadership. I know some of the people in the Institute are looking at this, and it's an area I want to look at more myself in the future now. This Hardy here is Lou Hardy, who some people might recognize as a sports psych researcher at the University of Wales in Bangor. And Lou's done some good work recently with netball and that quintessentially British sport, Ultimate Frisbee. <laughs> Go figure. <laughs> Um, with transformational leadership, but perhaps less comically, he's been using it at Sandhurst with the British Military Academy, um, with the British Defence Forces um, involving some of these performance psych folks, having to prepare some of their young officers who are going to have to go off and fight in, in the Middle East. So this transformational leadership, New Zealand Army's got me involved in using some of the stuff recently as well. Um, a, an area I want to look at, and perhaps we could talk to some of the Institute people later about it. It's, I know Gagney and Ken Sheldon have talked about how transformational leadership has some conceptual alignments with autonomy, supportive coaching and leadership and managing. But my research around the literature, I haven't been able to find any empirical, anybody that's empirically tested that relationship. It's just assumed at the moment, from what I can tell. If somebody knows different, that would be great to hear. All right, for the coaches, we'll just finish off. We've got a few minutes, Chris, I think. So practical recommendations, but a couple of words of caution before I go through them. This is one team, right? It's a case study, so please don't think this is the way everybody should coach. It's one team and one type of sport. It's an invasion, interactive team sport. It's also a sport, a team playing at the professional level, the elite level, when they're in camp and in the All Blacks, they're, they're, they're together 24-7. It's not an amateur team like I'd be coaching, which gets two one and a half hour practices a week, and that's it. You know, so time's on their side to develop and implement these strategies. So please think about that if you're thinking this might be something you could use the teams or team or teach the coaches you work with. I think there is a lot we can take out of it. We just need to be really careful about what's doable, what's practical um, out there in the real world. Work for these guys, but they were full-time professional coaches and athletes. So just with those disclaimers in mind. I don't think any of these suggestions will surprise you. First one, the key one, dual management. Now for a team interactive sport like rugby, this makes entire sense, I think, and the research would support that from achievement goal perspective. There's also evidence here. Different types of team sports or non-team sports may not be as important or as useful. But for interactive team sports like rugby, where a lot of decision making on the field has to be in the hands of the players, dual management we would argue it helps empower those players to be able to be better prepared to do that. Second point there is a mindset of transformational leadership. I haven't got time to get through that, but if you're interested, the six characteristics of transformational leadership, and there's some really good, uh, Kellen Martha here and Lou Hardy at Bangor and, and Mike Smith, done, there's some really good practical examples and articles that are cited there, and I've got the references there in a moment if you're interested. Third one is learning how to be an emotionally intelligent coach, which is not as straightforward as the first two. But there's some, in Cliff's article there with Chan, there's some really good practical examples there from his experience. Cliff, if you, know, if you don't know, is, he's an academic, but he also coached the Australian, I think, 400 metre relay team at the 2004 Olympics. I mean, he's an elite coach himself, so he's road tested a lot of this stuff. And a lot of the stuff we talk about, autonomy, supportive coaching strategies, and there's some practical examples in these various ones as well. So there's a lot of more detail about each of those suggestions available if you're interested, if you're a coach or a coach of coaches. Um, I'll go through the next part reasonably quickly, but this is just a corny little um, acronym I put together. I, as Chris can tell you, I'm, I'm good at being corny, um, and I've got, I am a bit forgetful, so I find corny little acronyms are a good way to remember things and a good way for your players to remember things. And I don't know about you, but as you're reading through those five themes and the various quotes from the coaches, the word that just, to me, permeates all of that stuff is respect. Coaches respect their players. And respect, it seems to me, indirectly is a huge part of what the three basic needs in self-determination theory are. We're showing respect to you if we're trying to honour your needs and trying to help you develop. Not that we're selling the farm and giving everything to you and it's all about you. On the other hand, we're not ignoring you and your needs either and just doing what I want. So respect, I think, is a huge part of that. 
So I've used RESPECT as an acronym in each of these letters just for a corny way to try and remember some coaching strategies on the, you saw on the previous slide. So the R could be for responsibility. First E could be for empowerment. Self-reliance, self-direction, big part of the dual management model. Bunch of P words, people pride and purpose. Engagement, it's an area Chris and I have done some work on, but also self-esteem, two areas that resonate with positive psychology. Competence and capability. And the T, trust as I mentioned, but also tough love. As I said, these coaches cared about their players and the dual management model showed they cared a lot. But they weren't above non-selecting players, a polite way to put it, if you weren't up to it or you didn't deliver. So there was some tough love and tough expectations required as well. So it seems to me this is a great message for youth sport coaches, or coaches at any level. In some countries, North America is a classic, the coaches are often characterised, and some of them are, just bullies. Coercive, controlling, my way or the highway, I'm the boss, do what you're told, if you don't do it, we'll find somebody who will. And that model tends to get adopted and seen as the way that you coach at the elite level. And I've found in New Zealand at least, and about here, a lot of youth sport coaches think, well, that's the way I should coach because that's the way the top guys do it. Well, here's the, a great example of coaches not doing it that way, respecting their players as humans first and players second, and still being successful. 85% win rate in a World Cup. Now, the indigenous people in New Zealand, Maori, have their culture and their language is very rich with proverbs. And I just love this proverb. They, they use a lot to sum up a lot of the focus of Maori tanga and tina rangatanga. It goes like this. Hei aha tamia ta nui o teo. Hei tangata, hei tangata, hei tangata. And you'll see in a moment how this connects to respect. So translated, what that means is, what is the most important thing in the world? It is people. It is people. It is people. Simple statement that I think sums up a lot of what this respect and what the All Black coaches did with this group. The people first, players second. And that, to me, is where they're better people. Better people make better All Blacks. Comes into it perfectly. Now, I'm not suggesting for a moment this is going to automatically lead to coach, coaches and players having a love in, or they're automatically going to win a, win a rugby World Cup. But the neat message, I think, for non-elite coaches and non-elite sport is that you don't have to sacrifice caring about life skill development, other things I'm interested in, um, at the altar of win, 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 win. It's a win, win. That both are capable. So you've got a team here that was able to deliver on both. I think it's a wonderful message for non-elite coaches that you don't have to be the bully controlling my way, the highway person to actually make that happen. So thank you very much for your attention. I, I know we've got a little bit over time with having the food first and so on. If you need to get away, please don't, I won't be remotely insulted. I'll just take it as a standing ovation if you've got to head out. <laughs> um, but I'm happy to field questions and chat about the stuff over a coffee later too. So. Well, first of all, let's, let's thank Ken very much for coming in today. We do have a, a small token of our appreciation, and I know there are one or two of you who do need to sneak away. Thank you so very thank much. You for coming thank along, Ken. You're welcome. And um, we'll, uh, we'll open the floor to questions for those who, who don't have to sneak away right away. Fire away with some questions for Ken. Yep. When you talk about focus on the strengths for the All Blacks, yep. I mean, you're building on a base that they've got. Pretty high up there. Yes. How about for school kids and uh, and the kids working through training? Yeah. You still do you still focus on their strengths there? Absolutely. Doesn't mean you the key the key message there is they're not ignoring weaknesses, but you're not only focusing on weaknesses. Imagine if you're a kid and you're a late developer, or you're a slow learner, so to speak. I was one of those kids. You know, I got to be a reasonably good rugby player, but I didn't get there overnight. That's for darn sure. Now, if all I had some great coaches as a kid, so they helped me, I think. If all I'd heard was, you're no good at this, Ken, you need to fix that. Shit, this is not good enough, Ken. You know, if I, that, is that all I heard every training, every training, I think I'd have probably gone somewhere else. So pretty pretty there, discouraging. Is there strengths that pull up? 
Well, I think it is. If you think, if you think about, I mean, there's a lot of psych support to support this. People like feeling self-esteem, right? But you feel good about yourself if you're able to focus on things you're good at. So if someone telling you that this is a strength, you're good at this, and how can we help you get even better at it? You start feeling good about your competence, or even though you've got weaknesses, the coach is also telling you about, you've got something here that I'm good at. I can feel good about that, and it feeds on itself. So it can help maintain, I think, motivation and self-esteem and confidence, which is a very fragile thing in my experience with athletes of any level, um, to, to highlight and cherish and celebrate what you're good at, but not ignore your weaknesses. It, it, I don't think every training would be all about strengths and no weaknesses. You'd balance it during the week and over a season. But I think it's easy to fall in the trap of only focusing on weaknesses, particularly if you're an amateur coach and time's tight and there's a lot of stuff to fix, which there often is. It's tempting, I know, from having been that, a coach in that level. We've got so much to cover here and so much we're not doing right. We'll just spend all night fixing mistakes and errors and... And in some ways that's important and useful, but if you're doing that every week, it seems to me that's going to get pretty demoralising. Particularly if you're a kid who isn't a quick learner and you're not fixing those mistakes overnight, it's, you're battling a bit. So like a lot of these things, it's a balancing act, I think, trying to find the balance and a good coach, most intelligent coach can try and do that over time. Yep. Kennedy, you, you talked about the um, dual management system and um, in terms of Tana going and speaking to Graham yeah. about, about the team talk, if, the, if, if that was, if, was that Tana's um, personal feelings towards the team talk or was that... Was that no, he was representing the... Lead. They, have, they have a leadership group which is part of the dual management model, yeah. which is about... Um, it varies. Um, at that stage they had about, I think, out of the squad of 30 odd, I think they had a dozen players in the leadership group. So he was sort of representing the leadership group in that meeting. And then how did, he, how did he go about implementing that? Did he just turn up to the next game and there was no team? Oh, no, no, no. No, he, he said, said, look, you know, he went to the leadership group first and said, you know, Tana's been telling me about this. And, and he said, you know, I'm taking it on board and how do you think we should manage this? And then they did a bit of a transition. Yeah, okay. So it wasn't overnight, yeah, because some players would feel a bit lost, wouldn't they? Yeah, well, I'm used yeah. to that. Even if I sit there and nod and ignore most of it, it's still part of my game day. Yeah. So... It, they did ease it in, and they certainly made it wasn't wasn't dropped on the players as a surprise. Do you think that'd be a, a more um, more related to that elite level? Sport yeah, I think yeah, I think so. Because you know, if you're coaching the amateur level, ever like most of mine has been, as I say, you have got two one hour, one and a half hour trainings, and you get together on Saturday morning, and you know some of your players aren't that gifted; they're not All Blacks. And some of them may not be that smart at being able to incorporate your whole game plan. You need to remind them of some key things. And sometimes the weather's changed and you need to remind them what the adjustments are going to be because of the weather conditions or the opposition's changed for some reason. So, yeah, I think at the elite level it's easy to, easier to do that because if you've done your work during the week, the players should be equipped to do everything on game day. Yeah. At the amateur level, you need to think carefully about how the group they've got. But I think the principle is still... Pretty important. Yeah, I think the principle of, of, of less is more yeah. applies certainly with, with younger players as well. I know what I've done with, I've, I was never a big motivational team talker as a coach because I used to think it was a bit silly when I was a player because I used to sit and nod every 30 seconds but ignore everything because I found it wound me up too much. So I, was never, I never did a lot of the motivation. I used to do a lot of tactics and strategy stuff as part of the team talk. So after I heard this, I started dialing back. I eliminated anything that was remotely, quote, motivational. But I told the players during the week, it's your job on game day to get yourself up. I'll trust you to do it, but if you don't do it, I'll find somebody else next Saturday who will. So, you know, the onus was still on them and there was still an accountability. And did you sort of factor that into your warm-up as well in terms of the way... Yeah, so some of it was a formal team tour like this and some was more, well, I had the trainer running some of the warm-up drills and I was just sidling around having a quiet word with some of the players or pulling a little group together just to chat about them, about a change in tactics or whatever it might be. But I think all of that stuff, collectively, that to me is just a wonderful way to show respect to your players. I trust you guys. doesn't mean you're not accountable. If you don't get it right, I'll find somebody else who will but I trust you to give it a go. Okay.
Ben, doesn't that also fit with at the start of the week you can almost have information overlaid because yeah. you want to free their minds by the end yeah. of the week, yeah. which can be hard with you. Yeah. There's, a, there's a great quote, I won't dig it up now because it'll take too long, but of, of, of uh, Richie McCaw saying somewhere, the, at the start of the training week, it's, it's 2080. Players don't say much. The 80 is the coaches. He said, by captain's run on Friday, it's 80-20. It's me and the senior players and the coaches say almost nothing. And that's... And then there's trust there by the coaches, right? I trust the players. I trust that what we've developed here is not going to fall on its face tomorrow. Thanks for coming. Thanks, guys. Thank you. So, yeah, the point you made before is you've got to read the group you're with. How mature are they? How knowledgeable are they? And for some people, I mean, I haven't mentioned it here, autonomy and all that sounds wonderful, doesn't it? But there is some research that autonomy without a skill set to deal with it can scare the crap out of some people responsibility they don't know how to deal with. Some kids like being given responsibility and autonomy, but some of them they find it quite frightening because it's like, oh, I'm not used to making decisions. Now you're pushing me out there without any help. So it's, I guess like any, it's just a different type of coaching. You wouldn't send somebody out there who didn't know how to kick or pass. Well, you wouldn't somebody out there, send somebody out there to make decisions if you haven't helped them learn how to make decisions. Yeah. My, my hunch is there's probably a, a few questions for people. There's coffee and everything outside, so uh, Ken, you can hold court uh, over oh. coffee and, and feel free to, to join us then. Thanks, everybody. Thanks for coming.